Hello, everybody, and welcome to our module on IEP alignment. This is our team, the General Supervision Monitoring and Support Team. And if you have any questions, you can contact any one of us at any time. And this is our contact information. You can get a copy of this PowerPoint right below here, um, right below this video. Um, here is a link for the procedural manual, which is a very good document when you are writing IEPs or any of those required forms. Very detailed information. So this is an overall um, visual for alignment. So it just kind of shows all of the um, elements of the IEP and how they kind of link together. And that is what we're going to talk about. So first up, um, there's this little section of Muser that nobody really thinks about much. But what it says is that if you have information in one section of the IEP, you don't ever need to put it anywhere else. So while we're talking about alignment, think about that. Just keep that in the back of your head. So we're going to start at the beginning. Good place to start. So the first part of alignment is making sure that your evaluations support the identification, that exceptionality identification for that student. So I think of it as the scientific process. So you probably took a biology class in college or even high school and learned about the scientific process. Um, so that is when you come up with a hypothesis based on observation, you test that hypothesis with an experiment, right? That experiment, those results will either support or um, reject that hypothesis, right? You might um, change the hypothesis a little bit based on those results and try again with a different experiment. Um, so that is really the eligibility process, right? You're your observation, your classroom observations, your um, RTI, MTSS data helps you come up with your hypothesis, right? We suspect that this student um, would qualify under OHI for ADHD, right? And then you have to choose which evaluations are able to support that disability category, right? So you do those evaluations you fill out your form, which is checking the results against that hypothesis, right? You may go back and say, oh, you know what? We need to do this other evaluation and try again, right? That happens not all the time, but it happens enough. Um, so that is the eligibility process. And that is the first part of alignment, really making sure that those evaluations are able to support that eligibility category. So this is what that looks like on the IEP. Um, this student was found eligible, OHI due to ADHD. And in section 4A, we have those evaluations that support that category, right? So you wanna keep those in there on those off years between reevaluations, keep those eligibility um, assessments in 4A. Don't take them out. You can put in your NWEAs, you could put in your FBAs, you could put in your transition assessments, whatever you want to put in there, but make sure you keep those eligibility ones in there until you do new ones in three years. So next part, section three, this is kind of your outline um, for your IEP, right? This kind of tells you what needs to be included in the IEP. Um, if you have a student with OHI for ADHD, um, we would fully expect that 3B is checked yes. Um, yes is not just for students who have um, BCBA support or a behavior plan. Um, 
It is also for students who get any kind of accommodation for behavior, like a preferential seating, um, anything like that. Um, 3B should be checked, yes. All right, so we have our evaluations and our identification, and those are gonna help us figure out academic and functional skill gaps. So this evaluation said that this student um, scored low in executive function, right? So we know this student or we, we spent some time or, you know, we know that this student um, has specific skill gaps in following a visual schedule and requesting help, right? So those are those executive fun. Those are going to help that student with that executive function. And then we have our how statement. These gaps affect Sammy's ability to access age-appropriate classroom activities, right? So we have two very specific skill gaps follow visual schedule and request help. You're not just gonna put executive function in there because executive function encompasses a lot of skills. And we want section 4C, 4D, 4E to be really specific skill gaps. And you can see here, we have a bulleted list. We love a bulleted list here on the monitoring team. Um, and you don't have to type as much with a bulleted list. So easier for all, it's a win-win. Just don't forget your health statement. All right, so we have our evaluations, our identification, and our gaps. Every gap that you list in section 4C, 4D, 4E gets a present level of performance. And that present level of performance is just your baseline data for that specific skill gap, right? So every one of those skill gaps up in section four has what's your baseline data? What, where is that student right now? So this is what it might look like. We have our skill gap of follow visual schedule. And right now, Sammy is unable to follow a visual schedule. That's data that we read that as 0%, unable to. Um, and then requesting help. With adult prompting, Sammy uses a help card to request help in 50% of opportunities. You can see that really clear baseline data. It doesn't say less than 50. It doesn't say approximately 50. It says 50. You want to really have really clear baseline data there. All right. And of course, every gap gets a present level and a goal, right? You don't want to put gaps up in section four and then not, not address them with a goal. So this is what that looks like. So we have our gaps, follow visual schedule, request help. We have our baseline data, and then we have our goal. So the first one, right? Sammy is unable to follow a visual schedule. And then we have that really specific um, Sammy will follow a visual schedule with up to four tasks, right? He will follow the task analysis, remove the visual for the completed task, place the visual on the all done square, reference the next, next task and travel to the appropriate area. And we want him to do this with 40% independence over five consecutive days, all right? So you can see a couple things here, your present level baseline data and your goal reference the same data point, the same exact skill. That's important. And you're going to use that same data for your progress monitoring. Um, the other thing is, and this is just a little aside, um, we want him to do this with 40% independence, right? We're not doing 80% for everything because we want to calculate this based on what we think Sammy can achieve in a year. So that is important. So our second one, requesting help. Um, with adult prompting, Sammy uses a help card to request help in 50% of opportunities. And where do we want him to go with that? We want him to independently follow the task analysis, pick up the help card, reach to communicative partner and release the help card. So he's exchanging the help card to request help. 
in 40% of opportunities. So we're going from with adult prompting, 50% opportunities to independently, 40% opportunities. So you can see the alignment from gaps to present level to goal and really also specifically between present level and goal, there's alignment as well, right? It's the same data point and that's your data point that you're using for progress monitoring. So next is special education and related services, right? Because we don't expect students to achieve their goals by themselves. We give them services that allow them to achieve their goals. So um, you could see that these are two-way arrows all the way, gaps to present level, to goal, to services, because they need to align in both directions, right? Every gap needs a goal. Every goal needs a gap. Every goal needs a service. Every service needs a goal. Um, when we come on site and look at IEPs, we actually do look in both directions. When we're looking at gaps, we make sure that every gap has a goal. And then as we're looking through the goals, we make sure each goal has a gap. And we do the same with goals and services. We look in both directions. A quick note about um, services. Consultation is specific to student goals, and it is a service in um, Section 7. So make sure if you have consultation in Section 7, it is aligned with a goal. You can put, um, you know, given specially designed instruction and OT consultation in the same goal. You can be working on the same goal. Um, with one of your team members, um, just make sure that it is uh, referenced in a goal so that you have that alignment. Um, if you're just talking about teacher to teacher check ins that is not um, specific to a goal, put that in section six and please call it collaboration instead of consultation because consultation is a service that needs to be aligned to a goal. All right, so here is um, that alignment. So you can see our, our visual schedule, um, our visual schedule goal is aligned with that SDI for executive function. And the help card goal is aligned to the specially designed instruction for executive function as well as BCBA consultation, right? So you could see given specially designed instruction, BCBA consultation and access to a help card. Um, so you can see that alignment in there. All right, now section six, you can see it's a dotted line there for supplementary aid services, modifications and or supports aligned to goals, but only in one direction. That's a one-way arrow there. And that is because if you have a support aid modification, something referenced in a goal, make sure it's in section six. Um, and that would look like this. So the first goal, right, given specially designed instruction and a visual schedule with up to four tasks. So we're referencing the visual schedule. And the second one is given specially designed instruction, BCBA consultation, and access to a help card, right? So that is identified in that goal. So we want to make sure in section six, we have visual supports, including visual schedule and help card. And that way, everybody knows that this student needs to have those things available. It does not work the other way. Um, you can absolutely have accommodation supports in section six that are not referenced in a goal. Um, for example, once Sammy masters use of visual schedule, um, you're going to want him to continue to, you're going to want him to use the visual schedule, right? Once you teach him how to use it, he masters that, but you're teaching him how so that he can actually use it to get through his day. He doesn't need a goal around it anymore because he mastered it, but he, He's st you're still going to want him to have access to a visual schedule. So that would stay in section six. All right. 
So here we go. We have the whole IEP. We did our evaluations, our identification. That helped us um, figure out academic and functional skill gaps. Every gap has a present level, goal, and service related to it. All of our um, supplementary aid services that are referenced in goals are also in section six. We've had this whole conversation at the IEP meeting and that all of these things lead to our discussion of least restrictive environment. And this is from the procedural manual, talks all about it on page 37. Um, I would like to point out that for least restrictive environment, um, Leora says, this is my kryptonite, um, the prompt in the IEP does not match what, what you need to write in there. We're working on fixing that. But this um, section of Muser, and this actually comes right from IDEA, says that removal of students with disabilities from the regular educational environment shall occur only when the nature or severity of the disability of a child is such that education in regular classes with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved satisfactorily. So when you write your statement in the LRE section, that's what we're looking for. How, what is it about this student's um, identification, exceptionality identification that interferes with their ability to be with their peers. And this LRE percentage is about physical location. It is not about services. So this statement, Sammy's other health impairment due to ADHD is, such, is to such a degree that he requires individual and small group instruction in the special education environment. That's all we need. So that is, it's, and it's about peers, it's about location not services. And we don't want you to repeat your service grid here because again, at the beginning we talked about um, you have something in one section of the IEP, you don't need to put it anywhere else. And that is all I have on alignment. Again, if you have any questions at all, um, feel free to reach out to any member of the team. We have some Fun links for you here. We have the um, DOE calendar where all of our, you can register for any of our professional development. Um, the professional learning page, which is how you got here. And then we have um, different resources, forms, procedural manual, muser, anything you need is on the website. So we would very much appreciate your feedback about our professional learning. We are always trying to make it better. Um, we are all special education teachers on this team and we like to teach um, and we take it seriously. We take our professional learning seriously. If we go out to districts and the IEPs are not compliant, we look at that as an opportunity for us. Like, what are we doing or what aren't we doing, right? How can we change our training so that um, things are better in the field? So um, uh, just a really short feedback form and then put your email in and you will get a contact hour for this training. So thank you very much. And again, reach out to us anytime. If you are writing an IEP and you aren't sure if something is compliant, um, you're not sure about a goal or a present level um, or a gap statement, LRE statement, anything, shoot us an email, um, but do it as a hypothetical. Please do not send us IEPs and do not send us identifying information for children. Um, we are bound by um, OSEP, which is the Office of Special Education Programming, which is the federal entity. Um, we are bound by 
their memo 0902 that says if we see something that is not compliant, we have to ask for correction and then we have to ask for evidence of systemic correction. So we will have to ask you for three to five more IEPs that are correct. And then it snowballs and it becomes a nightmare. So hypothetical email, if I were to write a goal that looked like this, would that be compliant? That kind of thing. We are really happy to provide any kind of feedback. So reach out to any one of us. And thank you very much for watching.